42nd Psalm. Once you have it, say amen. 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 We want to look above verse 1. We want to look above verse 1. If you have it, say I'm there. Above verse 1 it says, To the chief musician, Meskiel, for the sons of Korah. Psalm 44, above verse 1. To the chief musician, for the sons of Korah, Meskiel. Psalm 45. To the chief musician, Upon Shashanim for the sons of Korah, Meskiel. Psalm 46. To the chief musician for the sons of Korah, Psalm 47. To the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah, Psalm 48. A song and psalm for the sons of Korah. Psalm 49, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. Thus ends our reading. I want to preach this morning, as the Spirit shall guide with this thought in our minds, a subplot in a subscript. You may be seated in the presence of our God. A subplot. In a subscript, a subplot in a subscript. I know you're probably wondering, what is he doing? Hey Amen. Stay close to me and I won't let you drown. A subplot in a subscript. Twelve days. After the earthquake in Haiti, the Haitian government called off all searches for persons believed to have been buried alive. Instead, they would focus their attention and their efforts on those who had been rescued and those who had been left homeless. Upon hearing that, the United Kingdom made the decision to return their disaster response teams back to Europe because the search and rescue phase of the mission had been declared over by the Haitian government. At the time of the announcement, at the time of the decisions, some 132 persons had been pulled alive from the rubble. Some 200,000 had fled the city of Port-au-Prince. Some 600,000 had been left homeless. And after this decision to cease and desist had been made by the government, it was said that some 62 rescue teams ignored the decision to cease and desist. One, one team was reported to have said that no matter who else has decided to give up, we refuse to quit. Now this isn't for everybody, but I'm looking for about 62 people in the house who refuse to give up on the people that the crowd has said are hopeless. On the same day, that the government declared all search and rescue efforts over. A young man by the name of Wismond was found buried underneath the rubble of the supermarket in which he had worked. When they pulled him out, a Swiss television reporter asked him how was he doing and how he managed to survive. To which he responded, I feel great because I was blessed to work in a supermarket and as a result, I was buried with the stuff I worked with. I ain't even got time to preach that. Now, 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 it was later reported for that, that for much of that day, his brother, Wismond's brother, had been forced to stay away from the devastated area where the supermarket once stood. As a matter of fact, it was said that he was being very disruptive. In fact, one person reported that Wismond's brother was even being delusional because for several hours prior to them finding Wismond, he kept shouting to the people, I hear my brother calling beneath the rubble. 
And finally, because he refused to stop shouting, people decided to go check it out. And they discovered that his ears had not deceived him. But don't miss this now. Every now and then, you need to shout out to God on behalf of somebody that's in your family that's been buried beneath some stuff that's trying to kill them. I know it's still early in the sermon, but if you've got somebody that's buried beneath something in your family, I dare you to shout this morning like they're still alive. Shout them to your neighbors think you're delusional. Shout them to the folks on your road think you've lost your mind. Shout because you know that your Bible says that Jesus has come that we might have life. So shout for somebody in your family that the devil thought he could kill, but you know that they're still alive. I said shout for somebody in your family that the devil tried to kill, but you know they're still alive. See, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know who this is for. But see, every time you shout, you're lifting them from under the rubble of drugs. Every time you shout, you're lifting them from the rubble of depression. Every time you shout, you're lifting them from the rubble of suicide. Every time you shout, you're lifting them from the rubble of alcoholism. Every time you shout, you're lifting them from the rubble of promiscuous sex. Somebody ought to open up your mouth and shout with the voice of triumph like your people are still alive. Tell your neighbor, say, my family member's coming out. I'm going to shout until I see them. I'm going to scream until they show up. I'm going to holler until they come out alive. God help me preach it here. Sometimes you got to shout like you know your family member is still alive. So his brother kept shouting. And because his brother kept shouting, his shout made him go back and look one more time. Somebody just missed what I said. Because he kept shouting, his shout made him go back and look one more time. Don't you know when you come up in here and shout, the angels will go back and look for your family member one more time? Get the picture. Get the picture. After the government had declared that the search and rescue phase was over, somebody was still found alive. Now, I know somebody is probably trying to figure out what does this have to do with that little portion of writing above the verse that we read from the Bible? Well, what you read was the inscription above the song. Now, inscription above the Psalms identify for us who the writer of that particular Psalm was. Some of them, when you read your Bible, it's recorded as a Psalm of David. We know that David wrote 77 of the 150 Psalms. One of them, you will see a Psalm of Moses. And that identifies them as the person who wrote that particular Psalm. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Now, one of the things that becomes readily apparent as you read the hymns of Israel is that they were birthed out of their experience. This had nothing to do with somebody, what somebody had told them, but they pinned the words of the Psalms based upon their own experiences with God. When David says that the Lord is my shepherd, he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He's reflecting on his own experiences as a boy, leading his daddy's flock. Now this has come to no great surprise to any of us that are here this morning because even in this current age, our songs and our hymns are based out of our own experiences with God. Our testimonies of challenge and triumph. The songs that we sing in our spirit that nobody else can hear. This has nothing to do with Hezekiah Walker or John P. Key, but the songs that we sing in our spirit are testimonies of what the Lord had brought us through. So when you look at the inscription above Psalm 42 and Psalm 44 and 45 and 46 and 47 and 48,